I've been itching to ask you this one philosophical question since the beginning, since you brought up computation. So I'm just going to bite the bullet. It's in my nature. I have to ask you if the universe is computational, if the rules are fundamental, if the rule yet is at the bottom of all of this, if the branchial space is foundational, who created the universe, who created the rules, who created the rule yet? Why does the universe exist at all? You know, I think it is less surprising that the universe exists than that we exist. So in other words, the, the, this idea, so we, we didn't talk so much about, we talked about how applying these rules can generate kind of the structure of space, the progression of time, these kinds yeah. of things. But then the question is why these rules are not other rules. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I realized is that actually one can think of all possible rules as being applied. And that leads to this thing we call the Rouliad, which is this kind of this entangled limit of all the application of all possible computational rules. One thing that's important about the Rouliad is it's unique. There is only one thing that is this limit of all possible computational rules being applied. There's no freedom in it. It's not something where you say, well, I don't like that Rouliad, I want this Rouliad instead. There are different ways to look at that object that is the Rouliad, but there is only one structure that corresponds to the Rouliad. And so that, that's an inevitable thing. It's as inevitable as the fact that once we've defined what two and two are, then two plus two equals four is inevitable. There's no way to say, no, 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 I want two plus two to equal five. Given the definition of terms, it is inevitable that two plus two equals four. Yeah. And so similarly, given kind of the definition of terms, it's inevitable that the Rouliad is a construct. Now, the question is, but now, given that you feel that the Rouliad, you know, that given that the Rouliad is this construct, everything that can exist must be part of that construct. So in particular, we must be part of that construct. Yep. And so then this question of what is our perception of the world becomes how does this thing embedded within the Rouliad view the Rouliad? Yep. And you might think that there will be nothing to say about that, that the Rouliad is, is all these different possible computations. And, you know, how could you have anything to say based on just saying there's an entity kind of observing the Rouliad? Well, it turns out that the fact that if, if the entity that's doing the observing is even vaguely like us, it implies that what that entity observes must follow certain laws that turn out to correspond to the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So the, the things that are critical about us as observers seem to be, among other things, that we are computationally bounded and that we believe we are persistent in time. So that we are computationally bounded tells us that there's limitations to what we can perceive about what's, hap what's really happening, so to speak. So the place where this shows up most immediately is the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy increase, the law that says, you know, you start with a bunch of molecules that are in a very orderly state. They'll tend to, when they bounce around, they'll tend to end up in a state that seems to us to be disordered and random. Yeah. Um, so, the, but it's very important when we say to us, because there's a very definite path of all these molecules. It's just that when we look at them as computationally bounded entities, we can't untangle all the computationally irreducible processes that went on in those molecules. So we just say, oh, it looks random to us. Mm -hmm. And that's why we perceive the second law of thermodynamics to be a law of physics, so to speak. Well, it turns out that when it comes to space, when it comes to quantum mechanics, we're in sort of the same position that because we are computationally bounded and we also, because we believe we are persistent in time, it's an important condition because it's not obvious that, I mean, we're made of different atoms of space at every moment in time, yet we perceive there to be a different, definite thread of experience that we have through time. It's not obvious that that would be that way, but it is a feature of us that we believe that. And so then the question of, of what, given those conditions, what we perceive in the Rouliad necessarily corresponds to something which follows the laws of physics that we have. Now, the question is, why is there anything that exists in the Rouliad that has these features of being computationally bounded? There's a kind of a whole observer theory that I've tried to develop that has to do with kind of making, when, when you observe things, what you're trying to do is take all the complexity of the world and kind of stuff all those details into a finite mind. You have to ignore a lot of things. We have to ignore, you know, we have all these pixels in the scene that's coming into our eyes. Most of them we ignore. 
and we just say, oh, we're just seeing a person in front of us or whatever else. Um, and so that, that equivalencing, the fact that there is an entity that does that equivalencing, that acts as an observer, and that such an entity exists in the Ruliad, is not obvious. And in fact, you know, it's a, it's a piece of science I'm trying to do to try to understand to what extent and when and how often and so on entities like us can arise in the Ruliad. But so I view it as being kind of the, the um, it's almost like a, if you put it in a very kind of a theological way, it's kind of like you can argue, you know, does God exist, so to speak? Is there, is there an everything, so to speak? And then it is, I think, less, you know, it is easier to understand why everything exists than we, why we in particular exist, so to speak. And so I think the, you know, the challenge ends up being, my guess is that a lot of aspects of the world as we perceive it are reflections of the way that we happen to be as observers of the universe. And that's not something where at some level, there's no scientific explanation of that. It's like, why are we in this particular galaxy and this particular planet, etc.? There's no way to explain that. It's just that is where we are. And so similarly, when we look at kind of rulial space, the, the space of possible sort of interpretations of the universe, there's a place where we are. And by the way, it's important, I think, that we're sort of all, we're all in it together, just like we're all on this planet together, so to speak. We're all very, very nearby in rulial space. Yeah. So that means that we have a very similar perception of what's going on in the universe. If you imagine sort of the, the aliens that are, you know, far away in real space that have a very different perception about what's going on in the universe might be very hard to communicate with them, might be very hard to align our thinking with theirs. But that's, that's kind of the, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the notion. So, so this question, uh, I, I'm uh, uh, of, of sort of what, well, let's see, I mean, the, the sort of why does the universe exist? Um, I think the universe exists because it is, is, it is a purely abstract formal thing at some level. The universe is a necessary thing in the same sense that two plus two is necessarily four. What is not obvious is that an entity like us exists within this thing mm -hmm. and that that entity will, it is then inevitable, it's then a scientific inevitability that that entity will perceive certain features of the necessary thing that is the Ruliad. Um, why, why entities like us exist? Uh, that, that there is some science still to be done to figure that out, to figure out what causes, because, because let me give the example. I mean, the fact that it is in many aspects of us are important, like the, the, the size we are is important. Like, for example, we believe in space. The fact that we believe in space is a consequence of various kinds of scales. So for example, you know, look around the room, it's 10 meters to the other side of the room or something, light gets from that side of the room to me in a microsecond. Yeah. Yet my brain does not respond to that for milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's kind of like, there is this state of space at a moment in time. But if I was a different size, that would not be a thing. If I, if I, were, if I thought a million times faster than I do, then I would see all the photons arriving yep. and I wouldn't necessarily believe in this thing that is this sort of slice of space at a given moment in time. So a lot of these aspects of the way that we perceive the world depend on the way we are. Now, the question of whether, why it is the case that it's even, it's, it, it's something you have to prove that's even possible to have an entity like us in the Ruliad. That's, that's not so hard to establish, but it is something where, you know, is that a generic thing that happens? Is that, you know, how common are entities like us in the Ruliad, for example? I don't know. But that's a thing that is conceivably scientifically answerable. Um, and, and then you have to ask, you know, as you go a certain distance away in Rulial space, what is the probability that you have another entity that has certain characteristics and so on? Um, but those are things that, um, uh, you know, to me, this, this question of, of uh, for example, these questions about, well, it is merely a model, and what kind of energizes the model? What makes the model actually run? That's not a meaningful question, because the thing is ultimately, it is a necessary thing that simply, uh, you know, the, the, the progression of following these rules, this happens and so on, and following all possible rules, this is the structure that builds up. There's no, there's nothing that, nothing, nothing has to kind of execute that.
It just as just as two plus two equals four is not something you have to execute. It's just something that is. There is no creator, no god, no simulation that created the rule yet. That's outside of the rule yet. That's true. I, I think that I think that's a. It's a. You know, the rule yet is this inevitable object. The part that is. Uh, you know, the challenge is to say uh, there's. You know that we exist within this, and I mean, what you talk about. You know, I, I have not really traced it through, and it's sort of an interesting thing in different religious theological traditions. Yeah. There are different ways of thinking about the existence of the universe, the creation of the universe, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, uh, I think, one of the things that's pretty interesting about the science we've been doing is that those questions have mostly been ignored for the last 300 years yeah. because science has been doing so well and it has certain things that it concentrates on and those things aren't answering questions like why does the universe exist? And so we're now back to a situation where we can actually start asking those questions. Yeah. And I think it's it's a um, it's really quite interesting to try and understand sort of what the correspondence is between those kinds of questions. For example, here's here's one. I mean, this this whole question about, for example, subjective experience and its relationship to uh, kind of what's out there in the world yeah. are things that one can start to address. I'll give you just one one example of a kind of an interesting thing, which is you know as we as we sort of. Uh, uh, progress, we kind of ex start exploring physical space. We send out spacecraft. They get, you know, a certain distance away and so on. We can also explore rulial space by exploring sort of different points of view about how the universe works. Mm -hmm. And gradually, as science progresses, as paradigms get new paradigms get created, we're colonizing, we're exploring in rulial space. And so you might say, well, you know, clearly the future of everything is to expand our domain in real space, just like you might say the future of everything is to expand our domain in physical space. Yep. But it's one of these quite interesting, be careful what you wish for types of things. <laughs> because yeah. as you expand further and further in real space, and to some extent also in physical space, there is a sense in which you no longer coherently exist. That is, if, if you are everything, then in a sense you're nothing. The fact that we have a definite existence, a definite thread of experience, is a consequence of the fact that we are limited. If we were not limited, if we expanded throughout rural space, we would not have this definite sort of unique kind of coherent thread of experience. So it's kind of a, and that, that's, a, that's an idea, this idea that eventually you reach the point where you sort of melt into everything else in the universe is an idea that has existed in a bunch of theological traditions. Yeah. But it's not been something where there's been a way to kind of think about that kind of, kind of idea scientifically. Mm -hmm.